howdy folks, it is that time again. Well, hey folks, welcome to installment number 27 or 28 of the Vitruvian Book Review. I can't even remember at this point, but I'm on my path to 52 books in 2021. No less than 52 books. I think I'm actually going to read more than that, but the idea is to at least read one book a week. Before I get started on this review, I want to ask you to do me a favor. First, please listen to The Jason Wright Show. That's my podcast where I interview thought leaders, uh, New York Times bestselling authors, professional athletes, just remarkable people doing remarkable things that are trying to exercise my mantra, which is improve always and always. Actually, I don't know if that's what they're trying to do or not. That's what I'm trying to do. And so I have a podcast that gives me a platform to get out and talk to some really cool people. So selfishly in my endeavor to improve always and always, then I get to go reach out and have conversations with them. And it's really cool. And I would love if you would listen into those conversations every week on the Jason Wright Show. Another quick ask is please consider subscribing to the Vitruvian Letter. That is my weekly newsletter where I have usually one long-form article that connects to my uh, my blog. And then I'll also compile all the content that I've created from the podcast, uh, things I'm listening to like uh, different music, documentaries I've seen, maybe just some random piece of research that I found in a scientific journal that I thought would be useful. I kind of compile it all there in that one place for uh, for you to grab onto. That's the Vitruvian Letter. And you can subscribe to that at jasonrightnow.com. Okay, let's get into The Sun Also Rises by Ernest Hemingway. This was the book of the week, and I loved it. I, I, I'm trying to read more great American authors, and it doesn't get much more American author than Ernest Hemingway. And it's kind of interesting because you want to know what makes one writer so much better than all the rest. And Hemingway was kind of, uh, he was kind of tricky in this regard in that his writing was very simple. As a matter of fact, supposedly the old man in the sea, which ultimately led to Hemingway winning the Nobel prize for literature for crying out loud, it scored on like a fourth grade level. So it's like, that's amazing. You, you think that one of the greatest books by one of the greatest authors of all time, and his writing was at a fourth grade level. Not his intellect, but the writing. And so it's kind of remarkable, but that was Hemingway. And you know where Steinbeck, who's probably my favorite auth American author just because it's fun to read, I like the cadence and I like his humor. I like the way he paints pictures, but, but, the, but here's the difference. So Steinbeck will write something in a very direct American way but with a little, with just enough flair to go, man, I wish I could talk like that. I wish I could write like that. Hemingway actually writes like most people speak. Very direct, but, it, but, but that was the genius of it. It was so plain is probably the wrong word. And those of you who are literary scholars, you'd probably jump on me for calling Hemingway's language plain, but I think that's probably the best way I can think of to describe it. It's very plain, but somehow in the most basic, plain, and ordinary way, he could paint a picture so very well. And he wrote dialogue really, really well. That was one of the things that I really enjoyed about this book is that not only was the conversation where it made sense between all the parties involved, where you could get a sense of their personalities, which I think is really important. I mean, you know, no two people walk into a bar, right? That's one of the things that Chuck Polinwick says in his writing, in, in his book, um, Consider This on Writing, is that no two people walk into the same room. And and it's true because a plumber walking into a, to a room is going to have a much different view of things than, say, an investment banker or a physician or an auto, you know an auto mechanic is going to have a different uh, view of a room. It's it's, it's just, they're going to pick up on different things. And so, for an author to be able to structure the thoughts and the responses in during conversation to other parties in a way that you realize, yeah. Now that I know this character, 
that is consistent with the personality that has been developed. That I think is the real art of writing. And that's what Hemingway does really well. And so what's the sun also rises about? Well, it's essentially about Jake Barnes and Lady Barrett Ashley. So Jake, which is based on Hemingway himself back in the twenties when he was living in Paris and not long after world war one, this group of friends that essentially were kind of disillusioned after the first world war. And you got to realize, or what I had to really stop and think about whenever I, you, we hear this thing, the lost generation, why, why was the, why were these folks, the lost generation? Well, America didn't have its place in the world that it now has during World War One. It wasn't like the the lone superpower and kind of just you know perfect stability for the most you know you, I think you understand what I'm saying. It's just like okay, we're America. That wasn't the case back back in those days, and and there was a real during the the twenties there was just kind of a, the flappers, you know, the Roaring Twenties. All of a sudden, the chastity that had been, they kind of defined that Puritan work ethic and all that stuff. It was starting to be really questioned, and and women were exploring much more independence. And um, there just wasn't this uptight uh, kind of feeling and mood that uh, that came back during the 50s. It was just kind of a weird time for these folks. And so what The Sun Also Rises does, it follows a group of these, of these folks uh, for... I guess a, I would say, I guess it, you know, I should know this. I, I guess the the time frame it follows them over maybe a few weeks, and they end up going to the bullfights. And if you know anything about Hemingway, that was a big deal. He was really he loved the bullfights, and I learned about bullfighting because I I had no clue what that was, and it was fascinating. Uh, Ernest Hemingway gives you an e- education on bullfighting in this book because he was an aficionado of the sport, and it's really cool, but. The, the main thing, and I won't get into all the, I'll let the real experts uh, dive into the whole, uh, maybe the, the psychological things that were going on with all these characters due to the time period they were in. I'm just going to tell you about what I thought of the story. The story was kind of heartbreaking in a way because essentially uh, Jake, the main character, he obviously, Jake Barnes, who again is Ernest Hemingway, it's kind of he's it's through his character, uh, through, the character is based on him to a great degree. He suffered an injury during the war, which seems to be something that has caused him to be impotent. They never come out and say it. They never can't come out and say the dude can't get it up. Uh, sorry for the crew the, being so crass, but they don't do that. But there's a number of times where it's alluded to, and it's pretty obvious that that's the case. And and then you have. This lady, uh, Lady Brett Ashley, she's uh, uh, kind of uh, a, an aristocrat, if you will. That's why she's Lady Brett, and she's all, she's wild, she's crazy, she loves a good time, but deep down, she probably is in love with Jake. However, uh, she knows that he cannot make love to her, and that seems to be something she cannot overcome. Jake, on the other hand, he cares deeply for her. And this is kind of the cool thing about the story is uh, what's a great, what's a good example of a modern day story like where, well, usually whenever you have stories like this, like in, uh, well, kind of remember my best friend's wedding that where uh, Julia Roberts is the best friend. She ends up falling in love with the guy with her best friend at the end, but they, but they don't end up together, which was, Right. I don't think they did. Uh, but which is kind of cool because normally it's always, oh, you mean you're my best friend and I'm, I'm in love with you and you're in love with me. And why? What we you know, maid of honor. Oh, God, there's a great little rom com with uh, Patrick Dempsey that, you know, hey, what, what I always wanted was right there before my eyes all along. You know, it's kind of that old trite story. Well, this is one that not only does that not happen, but it's almost like it can't happen because of this injury. But the thing is, Hemingway kind of lets you decide for yourself why they never really got together. Was Jake really in love with her, or was he just a good friend? Was just he cared deeply about her. You know, he cared deeply, and but he didn't push so hard. He wasn't just desperately in love with her. One of the characters in the book is just 
obsessed with Brett and gets his heart broken. It just shatters him that, you know, she's fun loving and she's going to have a good time and she's not going to settle down with him. In fact, I mean, she's the chick that goes off to the bullfights and ends up having a relationship with one of the matadors. I mean, this chick parties, you know, she's, <laughs> she has a good time and this get, breaks this poor guy's heart. Well, it doesn't devastate Jake. And he probably deep down cares for her more than anyone else. And she actually knows this, but he doesn't just let it kind of, uh, he doesn't let it crush him. And I think the reason why is because I think that he has processed his injury to the point where instead of being bitter about it and bitter about the reaction of anyone else, instead he's just accepted that this is his life uh, almost in a, and, and there's a little bit of kind of, I mean, maybe I'm trying to put myself in his position. Maybe there's some cynicism, but really, and it, but it doesn't feel like he's pushing the, the basketball to the bottom of the pool at any time. Cause you never get a sense. He, he's really going to go crazy over this injury that he has. The fact that he cannot have sex. He doesn't really go into that. He just kind of has accepted it. And it's almost like it's this mental fortitude. This is my life. This is the cards I was dealt, and I'm going to deal with it. And he also doesn't lash out at Brett. He, you know, he, you kind of think that you, and you could easily understand why if he were to be really pissed off that she wouldn't date him because of this, that he would be really angry. And here's what gives me the idea that either one, he has just fully suppressed the idea that anyone will ever be able to really love him, uh, or maybe he just ha will not allow anyone to love him at all. Uh, you don't know. You don't know why he says this last thing, but this is how the book ends. I think it sums up Jake very well in the relationship between he and Brett. Downstairs, we came out through the first floor dining room to the street. A waiter went for a taxi. It was hot and bright. Up the street was a little square with trees and grass where there were taxis parked. A taxi came up the street, the waiter hanging out at the side. I tipped him, and I told the driver where to drive and got in, bes and got in beside Brett. The driver started up the street. I settled back. Brett moved close to me. We sat close against each other. I put my arm around her, and she rested against me comfortably. It was very hot and bright, and the houses looked sharply white. We turned out onto Grand Via. Oh, Jake, Brett said, we could have had such a damned good time together. Ahead was, mounted, ahead was a mounted policeman in khaki directing traffic. He raised his baton. The car slowed suddenly, pressing Brett against me. Yes, I said. Isn't it pretty to think so? So, it's almost, and it's just left to interpretation. Why is it pretty to think so? Because it's almost like it's pretty to think so, but the reality is, nah, it would never work out. And why is it that it wouldn't work out? Is it because of the injury, or is it because if there were no injury, that he just knew that... Yeah, they really cared about each other, and they, and he loved her probably more than he would ever love anyone else, and she loved him as much as she could love one guy and be kind of dedicated to one guy, but the reality is she's a free spirit. He's a really serious guy with a bad problem, and it just never would have worked. Uh, so you don't know. You just kind of draw your own conclusion. My estimation is Jake just would not. He just will not. He probably went through life not allowing himself to fully love anyone and live the rest of his life as a bachelor. And so, and then here's where I think it's just a fun read. I mean, how cool would it be to just get a bunch of people that you really like to hang out with and wake up and go, what are we doing today? Like, we're going to the bullfights. We're going to a party tonight. It's kind of like this long vacation. And I had a similar experience whenever I was in business school. This is what this reminded me of. We, part of our international study, it was, uh, our class and we had to go over to Shanghai and Thailand and Chengdu, China. And it was an, it was a temporary escape from reality. And we hopped along in a different culture from bar to bar and cool restaurants and 
ate things that we normally wouldn't eat and it was just and stayed up later than we normally would and just it was fun it was it was it was fun because it was just um we weren't there to vacation it was just kind of like that's what life was for that moment and that's what this book does it's just like this is just this the life of these characters for a little while in this period of time and man you know having been to uh to paris and i've never been to spain i want to go now you, you know, this book is what made the running of the bulls and, and all that, at least for Americans, this book, this is the one that made the running of the bulls such a big deal. And college dudes in particular for all over America wanting to make a pilgrimage to, uh, to hit the, to Spain, to go to the running of the bulls. This is the book that kind of set that in motion. Thanks, Ernest Hemingway. And it's, um, you know, I would sum it up. It's a great read. It's a great read. It's it's a good read. It's it's of its time. You know, I mean, basically, uh, you know, Hemingway was Hemingway, and I know that you if any if you look, I did. I went and I looked through a, s- several reviews uh, on some Hemingway books, and this one in particular, just to see what other people were saying about it and what they thought about it. You know, to check to see did I get the story? Was I completely off base? And a lot of them just go in with their Hemingway hate uh, because he was basically the complete antithesis of what uh, an American dude is supposed to be in 2021. And so, you know, we tend to, a lot of people tend to think that if they were uh, around in 1925, that they would be as evolved as they are now. Then it's just because they're just that much better than all those people. I'm not one of those guys. I try to take things in context for the period in which they had. And Hemingway lived in a different time. He was a different dude, for sure. Uh, but he also lived in a completely different time. And so putting that aside, it's a great story. It's a good love story. It's a fun story. Real quick read. Here's what I like about Hemingway's writing, just from that, from this standpoint. kind of a, If you're an aspiring writer, like I am, I want to write. Uh, he writes dialogue really, really well. The conversations are remarkable. He does, like... I, like I said earlier, uh, he, I think I said it earlier, I started doing a take of this and didn't like what I was saying, so I said it over. So, I don't know. Maybe I said it, maybe I didn't. But either way, here we go. You understand, he, he's consistent. The characters respond to one another based on the personalities he developed for those characters. You you feel that and you sense that. He paints a picture. You, you, he takes you to the little cafes and the little bars. He takes you to Paris, whether you've been there or not. Um, I, I, I now feel like I have a understanding of what the, where, where the characters were, the hotels they stayed in, the staff they worked with, um, just kind of the way they existed, their, their cadence, their rhythm of life from day to day during this time. And why? And also, it's the sense of I, I got the sense of man, how cool that would be, but also how listless that could be. It's a listless group of people that just kind of wake up every day with nothing to do. Um, so, it's a good book. I mean, I encourage anyone. Good Lord knows we need to be reading more as a whole. I won't get on that lecture soapbox or anything like that. But um, if you're going to start reading some of the great American novels. The Sun Also Rises is a good one, and it's not that long. It's not that long. It's fantastic, and um, I guess uh, that's it. Um, I uh, What else can I say? I think it's a great book. Check it out, and please subscribe to the channel. Check out the book reviews and all the other stuff that I'm posting here on the channel about ways that I'm trying to improve all ways and all ways. And again, uh, the Trivian Letter, please subscribe. Please, please, please subscribe. And the Jason Wright Show, please listen in. And uh, feel free to shoot me an email and ask me about different books or tell me about books that I should read or leave in the comments. Uh, I'm easy to reach. Just go to jasonrightnow.com. You can do, you can get to my email and everything right there. I'd love to hear from you. I would love your book suggestions. I would like for you to, if you if you want to hear a review on a book, um, please, I will, I will do that. Uh, anyway, just love to connect with you. So with that, thanks for checking out the review. I'm out.